Hi there. Welcome to another edition of Needlepoint TV. This is actually Thursday, May the 28th, 2020, and I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. I want to, before we dive in, uh, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor and type in where you're watching from, say hello, and if you're also watching this as a recording, uh, type in, you know, still type in where you're watching from, because it's always fun for me to go back and check that out. So, um, I'm Ellen Johnson. I'm the owner of Serendipity Needleworks, and I'm the founder of the Stitchers Club, and I am delighted to be here with you this afternoon for this late May edition of Needlepoint TV. So, let me go ahead and see if I can get the all of the things going here. I've got, um, I think we're good to go. Looks to me like we are set. All right, so it's looking like you can hear me and see me okay. You might want to give me a thumbs up. Um, I know it usually takes people a minute or two to find us, and so um, with that said, looks like we've got people that are just popping in like crazy now, so thank you. Um, I wanted to remind you that if you type a question in the comments box, there is a little bit of a delay between when you type it and hit enter and when I actually see it. So, don't think I'm ignoring you. I think it's about four or five seconds between when you hit enter and when I see it. So, um, just hang with me and I will do my best to get your questions answered. So... Great. Look, we've got such a wonderful group with us here today. I'm so excited. So we are on the last destination of our spring 2020 garden tour. And I can't believe it. I mean, it just does not seem possible that we've been, go that we've gone through seven different places already. Time has flown past. And so today we're going to chat about our seventh destination, um, if you have actually been to our seventh destination, which is the Portland um, Japanese Garden in Portland, Oregon, let me know that in the comments box. I know several people have actually been to some of the places that we visited on our virtual vacation, and it's been fun to hear your input. Right now, the Portland Garden is closed to the public, but I think along with a lot of these other places that are also closed, hopefully we'll be opening um, at least on a limited basis in the not-too-distant future. And as I've mentioned to several people who have sent me notes and um, you know, left comments in various places, I've, you know, every single one of these places I want to visit. I want to, I've made myself a new bucket list um, and for a road trip. And I know it's going to be a big loop of a road trip because they're all over the country. But uh, I definitely want to visit all of these different places because they are absolutely beautiful, each in its own way, and true treasures for us in our country. So, um, you know, I'm looking super forward to being able to hit the road and do that. So, all right, so let's see if anybody has actually been to the Portland Botanical Garden, um, or excuse me, the Portland Japanese Garden, because that particular garden has a very, very interesting history. I don't know if you've picked up on it or not by now, but I'm a huge history buff. My husband and I both are really big history buffs, and so... The story behind this particular garden I found to be extremely interesting, particularly uh, with when it landed uh, on our Threadventure Garden Tour, um, being that it was going to be the week of Memorial Day, and this is also the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, so this, this year is. And so one of the reasons that this particular garden was established was because the current mayor of, or the, may, the mayor of Portland at the time in the late 50s got together with a group of Portland citizens and decided that they wanted to take the site of an old zoo and convert it into a garden. Now during this time period, this was something I was really not, I was not familiar with. I didn't realize that this was sort of a movement at the time, but there were a lot of Japanese gardens that were being established in the United States. States at that time in an effort to sort of bridge the gap or the cultural gap between the United States and Japan, heal the wounds that had been um, caused because of World War II. Uh, you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of history there um, that goes, you know, not only with the Japanese Americans that are um, you know, citizens of our country and the, and the way that situation was handled, but uh, politics aside, um, there was an effort 
back in the late 50s to try and create some sort of a like I said, a cultural bridge between Japan and the United States to help the American people understand the Japanese culture. And because Oregon is on the West Coast, there was a, a pretty big influx of, um, of people, perhaps, I, you know, I shouldn't say influx, perhaps there was already a rather large population of people from uh, Japan who lived there, but there is, um, you know, there was that effort because there was a burgeoning, um, I guess you would say, relationship between the two countries. And in an attempt to further that, and again, like I said, to heal the wounds that have been uh, created because of World War II, uh, they thought that this might be a good way to perhaps begin that healing process. So they took the site of the of an old zoo and converted it into this particular into this garden and they hired a professor from um, a, a, an agricultural university in Tokyo and he actually well let me share with you the picture um, or some more information I actually will go to the post but I'm going to scoot through here and see um, so Julie says she used to live in Portland I wanted to see if anybody had been so Julie says that she used to live in Portland and it's a beautiful garden um, and Sandy says, do you need to record? No, Sandy, I'm good. Thank you for asking, though. That's a great question. Remind me this afternoon when we do our call for Canvas call, though, I will have to record for that one. This one automatically does it. So, all right. So, we are, let me see, let me find. Okay, so I don't see anybody else who has been to that particular garden, but I do want to share my screen so that y'all can see a couple of pictures of the garden, and then we'll just chat just a second about the um, significance of this garden because there is some really interesting information about it. Usually, Japanese gardens are, they have a singular format. So there's, there's one basic kind of layout or um, plan that's followed, but this professor decided that he wanted to include different five different styles because he wanted each, um, well, wanted several different historical developments in Japanese garden architecture to be represented. So he did that, and um, in 1967, the garden opened to the public, and then in 1981, it became a year-round garden, and today, it's still a year-round garden. There are actually eight different um areas in the garden and, and plus a cultural village. So the one that we, or that I actually chose for us to go to and visit was the Strolling Pond Garden. So if you haven't been over to the Serendipity Needleworks website to take a peek at this week's blog post, it would be a good idea to do that once we get off here. I'm not going to take the time to go through and read everything about this um, particular garden, but I did want to share some of the pictures with you so you'd have a visual in the event that you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So... The Strolling Pond Gardens were um, prevalent during, well, actually over a pretty long period of time, almost 300 years, um, during a period of time called the Edo period. And usually they were um, on the grounds of a home of an aristocrat or um, yeah, some of the land barons in Japan at the time. And you can tell water is a recurring theme here, and that's actually the stitch that we're going to talk about today is a stitch that you can use to stitch smooth water. So I wanted to make sure that I got down here to this, this stitch diagram so you can see. The Nabucco stitch is a great stitch for, um, for that particular thing, for um, stitching water, smooth water on a canvas. And I chose to use a thread called Water and Ice from Rainbow Gallery. We'll talk about it in just a minute. But in addition to being able to use this stitch for stitching smooth water on your canvas, like ponds and lakes, things that don't have a, water that doesn't have a lot of movement to it, you can also use this stitch for mountains and sky and meadows or lawns and snow. And it's also a really, really good background stitch. So those are just some different uses for it. It's not hard to do. Um, one thing that I will, and let me see if I can make my cursor really big so you can actually see, um, so you can actually see this. And I'm gonna pop over here and 
make it bigger, so hopefully it'll make it easier for you to see me pointing these things out. Um, so you can see, you start, this is worked in horizontal rows. You start at number one and then do a standard tent stitch. Um, take your needle to the back at number two. Then you're just dropping down one canvas thread from where you started to bring your needle to the front to work the long stitch because this stitch is worked, it's a short, long, short, long, short, long pattern. And it's a true diagonal stitch. Both of the stitches in this pattern are true diagonal stitches. That means they're worked over the same number of horizontal canvas threads as they are uh, vertical canvas threads. So this, the long stitch is worked over three canvas threads and up three canvas threads. So you're actually covering three canvas intersections. And so what, you, what you'll do is you drop down one canvas thread from where you started the first stitch and bring your needle through to the front, count over three canvas threads to the right and up three canvas threads and take your needle through to the back. This is one of those stitches, and I'm going to pop back on camera real quick. This is one of those stitches that when I first tried to do it, it was, I don't know, it just didn't make sense to me. And I know I've had a lot of students who have said the same thing. It's just hard to get the rhythm of this one. But I'm hoping that the way I'm going to go back and, and explain to you how um, how you get the rhythm going, it, it's going to help make it make sense. Because once you get going with this stitch, and once you get the I don't know, get, the, get in the groove, so to speak, get your stitching mojo in, in action. Um, it, it really is not hard to do, but for some reason, for me, it, it, there was just a block in the beginning, and I've had other students tell me that it was that way for them too. So let me go back and share my screen again, and then what we'll do is we'll talk through, well, let's try that again. There we go. We'll talk through um, how to execute the stitch. So you've worked a short stitch and then you've worked a long stitch. Now it's time to come back and work another short stitch. So from where you just ended, you're going to drop down one, two canvas threads and then back over to the left one. So come down two, over to the left one, work a tent stitch. And then to work the next long stitch, you're simply dropping down one canvas thread and you're going to work over three and up three. And then again, you're going to drop down two to the left one, work a tent stitch, come straight down, work, and that's just one canvas thread, then work over three, up three. Again, down two, back one, and then you're going to work the tent stitch, drop down one canvas thread, work over three and up three. So I hope that that helps um, helps it make helps it I guess make sense or helps it um, helps you understand a little bit better about how to execute that stitch. Truly, the more you do anything, the more comfortable you get with it. And I would just suggest getting a doodle canvas and practicing. And when you follow the numbering system on the stitch diagram, which is truly your roadmap, it's just an illustration of what the stitch should look like on your canvas. It's like a roadmap. If you follow the numbers on there, then you'll be set. Um, I like to say you'll be golden, actually, because, um, yeah, that's just um, exactly what the stitch diagram is um, is created for is to give you that roadmap to tell you where to put your needle when. And something for those of you who are relatively new to using stitch diagrams, um, anytime you have an odd number, typically, now I'm not going to say every time because there's always an exception, but you typically are bringing your needle through to the front on an odd number and taking it to the back on an even number. So let's chat just a little bit about water and ice. Water and Ice Thread is by Rainbow Gallery, and you can see, let me get this so I can see a little bit better here, so you, you can see Water and Ice. Um, I love this thread for the application that I'm using it for in this particular situation. So this is the transparent color, it's WT1. It's clear, and you can actually see through it, so it is 
I mean, I don't know if you're even going to be able to see very much. Yeah, you can see it pretty well. So anything that you have painted on your canvas is going to show through. Your, your paint, the painted design is going to show through. So if you're going to be stitching water, then the shading of the water will show through this clear thread. Water and ice comes in other colors, too. And so it comes in some blues, and I shared those in the blog post this week, some good colors, some good water and ice colors for water. But this is also a good thread for fire, for flames. So there are some yellows and oranges and reds that are good for stitching candle flames and also for stitching um, fires and fireplaces on Christmas scenes. And um, I know Sandra Gilmore has several, <clears throat> excuse me, has several room scenes that she's painted, and some of those have fireplaces, cozy fireplaces with little fires burning in, in them, and so this is a good thread for that too. Um, now, I will tell you, it's not my most favorite thread to work with, so you have to build in some time when you're going to be working with this thread, uh, knowing that it's going to take you longer to work with this than it does any other kind of thread or standard thread. So some things to keep in mind. Um, all right, so let me just give you a little bit of background information on it. It is 100% nylon, so it's a man-made fiber. Uh, they're 10 yards on a card, and like I said, it comes in a lot of different colors. It's actually best for long stitches. Now, I used it in this particular situation, even though the tent stitch is a short stitch, um, it does allow the paint to show through um, on your canvas if you use long stitches better than if you're using short tent stitches. Another good use for this is to actually use what's called the skip tent stitch. And you can, if you have, for example, I always use this example. My friend Sharon had a, 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 a canvas that she was stitching and it was a Sandra Gilmore piece and it was a little boy who was collecting bugs and he had a bug jar and so it was a glass jar and there were all these bugs painted on the inside and we thought how in the world are we going to paint or how is she going to stitch this so that it looks real and so what she actually chose to do was she stitched the bugs and then she went back and stitched over the places with the uh, skip tent stitch. So she stitched over the jar with the skip tent stitch and it looked so cool. It was just like the jar looked like it was made out of glass. It was really neat. So that's just one. I, I, this is also a good thread for windows if you have a canvas that has windows and um, I'm trying to think what else you might be. If you had maybe a canvas that had um, a uh, I don't know, a mirror or something on it, you could use this for that because it's going to give you some reflection because it is sort of a, it's not, it's not a metallic thread, but it is a reflective thread. So you're going to get the light playing off of it. And because it's a ribbon type thread, when you lay it smoothly on the surface of your canvas, the light is going to reflect off of it. So, um, so anyway, Lots of colors available. I think around 18 or so colors available. Some colors that are perfect for um, Halloween canvases. They've got some bright colors that are really fun for Halloween canvases. And so now, some tips on how to use this thread. Cut short pieces. You definitely don't want to be cutting pieces that are, you know, anywhere, I would say, no longer than 15 inches at the most. And that's going to include your waist knot that you're going to use. Um, that's the way I like to anchor with this thread because it does have a tendency to unravel. So you're going to want to catch it in your stitches that you're doing. Um, and let me see what else. You're going to definitely want to have a gadget called a thread zap or you're going to want to treat the ends with a product called Freycheck. So the Thread Zap is a, is a really, I think, was initially used as a tool for making jewelry. And it has a little element on the end that when you punch a button, it's battery operated. When you punch a button, that, that element lights up or heats up. And you can use that, heat, that element on the end to singe the ends of the water and ice, and then it doesn't unravel as much. So I'm going to just show you quickly. I'm going to try to show you. We'll see how well this shows up. Um, I'm going to show you how it unravels. It, it really, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it or not. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, let me see if I can get it up close to the camera. 
I don't know. We may not. Okay, you can kind of see it there. There's all kinds of little bitty fringes there. When I move it around, you can see each one of those is an individual strand that has come unraveled. So that's the reason you want to you want to treat the ends when you're using it and I treat both ends but one thing to keep in mind is you want to get it threaded in your needle before you treat the ends if you're using a thread zap and the reason for that is that um, the thread zap when it melts the ends of the thread sometimes it's hard to get it through the eye of the needle so go ahead and cut your piece off thread your needle and then singe both ends and that should um, solve that problem. If you're using fray check, then you're going to um, you're going to want to cut your pieces ahead of time. I would suggest cutting your pieces ahead of time and treating the ends, and um, and then once you once because fray check has to dry, so you want to make sure that you give it plenty of time to to dry before you start to work with it because it is kind of a gluey type substance and it'll get on your canvas if you work with it when it's damp. So, all right. Okie dokie, so um, let's see if anybody has any, so Cassandra says, is this the same as chronic blending filament? No, this is different. This is a product that's a ribbon type thread, and I suggest using a laying tool when you work with this, because you do want to make sure that you lay this flat, just like you would lay silk ribbon, neon rays, neon rays plus, flare, anything that you're going to be using uh, that's a flat ribbon type thread, you're going to want to use a laying tool with. So... All right, um, let's see. Sylvia says, would a candle flame be okay? I use them on satin. Yeah, I, you could. You just need to be really careful. I, I hesitate to say I, I probably wouldn't try it because I'm... I would, I would say, so let's, let's, let's think of this. Let's think of something else. Instead of maybe a candle flame that's, that's burning, maybe light a match and then blow it out and immediately put the burned out match or the blown out match to the end of it. And that should still have enough heat to maybe melt the end. It's worth a try. I'm afraid that if you tried to put this into a candle flame, it would just go pfft you know, and just maybe blow up, and I'm afraid you'd burn yourself. So I would hate to suggest that you do that. Um, so that would be my that would be my best suggestion would be to, you know, like I said, to, to light a match, preferably a wooden match, light a wooden match, and then, you know, let it burn, and then blow it out, and then stick the end of the thread on the end of the match so that maybe it would singe. I mean, it's like I said, it's worth a try. Okay, um, so... Cassandra says, can you tell what the difference between the two threads? Um, so the difference between, if you're asking about chronic blending filament, chronic blending filament is um, a single strand that's very, 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 ad infinitum, very thin. And this is a ribbon type thread that's flat and it's more along the lines of a, of a neon rays. It's not quite as, you can see, this is a flat thread. So, or at least you can, maybe you can see, um, it's, it's a, it's wide. Can't wait. Let me hold it up. So you can, it's wide. Chronic blending filament is teeny, teeny, teeny. Um, and I don't have any chronic blending filament or I'd be happy to show it to you. Um, but let's see. So, all right, so the L, uh, thank you, Joyce, for answering the question. L asked, what is the color number for the clear? And the color number is WT1. And so let me pop back over here to the, um, well, I'll just tell you because I can look at the screen on the blog post. So there are three colors that I recommended for water. Um, one is WT2, and I'm going to look down and see it's water blue is the name of it. WT13 is aqua, and WT14 is ocean. All of those are listed on the Serendipity Needleworks website in this in, in this week's blog post, so you can find those there. And I tried doing a stitch sample on my on a doodle canvas, and it just was not showing up, so I just abandoned that um, because this you know the the live camera doesn't show up the detail at least the one that I'm using for this doesn't show up as well um, as a still shot would so anyway that's um, that would be uh, you know something I would just practice on a doodle canvas the the color is very faint let me see if I can pull up um, quickly on the rainbow gallery website so y'all can see um, what the colors look like because they are really 
very, um, very translucent and you can see through them. So you could definitely use the colors and still have some of the paint show through, but it wouldn't, um, it, it wouldn't show through as much as it does with the clear. So let me hop over here and find that for us and I'll share my screen so you can see that here in just a sec. Let's see, let's pull that up. All right, so water and ice and let me share my screen again. Okay, so you should be able to see, let me blow that up a little bit. So you can see they do have some colors, darker colors, but these, these are the colors here, these two, and then this blue over here um, are the ones that I like for water. And then, of course, you have the yellows and the reds that are good for fire and flames. And then you can use the others for ice and snow and, and things like that. You know, sometimes canvases with um, snow have some shading on them. The shading has maybe some light blue or some light purple or some light gray. So you could use this for shading on snow as well. So, well, all right, y'all, I'm about to... Um, pop over to our Canvas call. We have, uh, it's Thursday afternoon, so those people who are members of the Stitchers Club, we always get together at 4 o'clock Central Time for Canvas call. I do want to just take a minute to remind you that there will not be a Needlepoint TV episode next week because I will be hosting our Girlfriends Getaway virtual retreat, and we will be working busily on some of our projects and things that we're going to be doing as part of that retreat. So uh, there will be a break next week, and I hope that you will join us again. You'll get a newsletter or an update, I should say. It's an, it'll be an update um, about when we'll resume because I'm going to be out of town the next week, so it remains to be seen if there's going to be a Needlepoint TV that next week. So June the, let me get my dates right here, so June the 1st is Monday, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 1, 2, 3, 4, so it would be on the, the 4th, so on the 11th. It's still uh, iffy about whether or not I'm going to do a Needlepoint TV on the 11th because I'm not going to be here um, at my home base at that point. So we'll just have to see. But uh, we will let you know so that you don't have to um, question whether or not you should show up. Um, but I do appreciate you being here with me today. Thank you ever so much. Again, um, it's always a joy to, to gather with you. Thank you for being here with me uh, through our, some, our spring, not summer, spring through adventure 2020 garden tour. This has been a lot of fun. And I will look forward to seeing each and every one of you again very soon. And I'll see those of you in the Stitchers Club here in just about 30 minutes for Canvas Call um, on our Zoom meeting link. So thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye for now.